Hey, you guys, Scott Horton here to remind you that it's fun drive time at the Institute right now. We only do this twice a year, but it's got to be done. And I'm proud to do it, too. We've got an incredible crew of the best writers, authors, and podcasters in the libertarian movement. From Jim Bovard, Lori Calhoun, Tom Woods, and Ted Carpenter, to Keith Knight, Kyle Anzalone, Hunter Dorensis, Connor Freeman, and all the rest of the guys. It's the best team around. We've published three books this year. Keith Knight's Voluntarist Handbook, Lori Calhoun's Questioning the COVID Company Line, and Joseph Solis Mullins, The Fake China Threat. And here any day now, we will be publishing Thomas E. Wood's Diary of a Psychosis, Jim Bovard's Last Rites, and Keith Knight's latest, Domestic Imperialism. That makes 13 books so far, with more coming in the new year, including my new one, Provoked, How Washington Started the New Cold War with Russia and the Catastrophe in Ukraine, which, I know, is already overlong and overdue, but I'm working on it, I promise. And which brings me to the point, we don't have a big glass office building in downtown Washington. The money we raise goes straight to payroll and book production costs, and that's about it. The Libertarian Institute is the best bang for your buck in the movement. If you believe in what we're doing, please go to libertarianinstitute.org slash donate for details on how you can help keep us going into the new year and the great kickbacks we offer as well. And we thank you for your support. All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, you guys, on the line for the first time in way too long is the Institute's executive editor and co-founder, Sheldon Richmond. Welcome back to the show, Sheldon. How are you? Thanks. Uh, I'm under the circumstances doing all right, Scott. Well, good. Um, Happy to talk to you again. And listen, uh, folks, if you're not too familiar, Sheldon is the author of the great libertarian primer, What Social Animals Owe to Each Other, and probably more importantly for our discussion today, Coming to Palestine, a collection of his essays that we published at the Institute last year or the year before that or something, uh, which is just fantastic and um, is a great, again, uh, introduction to the subject of Israel-Palestine from a libertarian perspective. Really good stuff. So anyways, um, I want to talk with you, of course, about some of the things that you've been writing lately and some of the things we've been talking about amongst ourselves here. Um, Hmm. And I guess particularly the fraught issue of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism and uh, who's allowed to think or say what and in what circumstances in the United States of America here. And, you know, as someone who, for some ungodly, unfortunate set of reasons I can't possibly begin to articulate lives on Twitter all day long. Um, I constantly hear what you're really saying is you're an anti-Semite. You hate Jews. You want Jews killed, blah, 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 blah. That's never a quote of anything I said. Although sometimes there are quotation marks around things I never said, but, um, you know what? I don't know. Obviously a lot of it is just, you know, has bar bots and trolls and whatever. But then again, that kind of PR does work on people who then internalize it and repeat it and really do believe that if you're against the Jewish state of Israel doing anything, then it's because you hate Jews and want to see them all killed. And I was wondering what you thought about all of that, Sheldon. Well, there's so many things to say about that. That's really, uh, it's a cliche. I know to say it's hard to know where to start, but it's certainly true. Uh, I think it's interesting that we can uh, begin by quoting a a Democrat in the House of Representatives who's not someone I'd ever quote on anything, Gerald Nadler. When the House, uh, was it last week, uh, was considering a resolution that, among other things, uh, equated anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, 
Gerald Nadler, who's a, a senior Democrat and, a, and and Jewish and represents uh, part of uh, uh, New York or Brooklyn, um, stood up to say, "I can't uh, I can't vote for this because too many of my Orthodox Jewish constituents are anti-Zionist and they're certainly not anti-Semites." Now, Nadler, by the way, didn't vote against the uh, for a reason I don't know. He voted only uh, present. He didn't vote against, but he didn't vote for it either. Uh, but but that's the answer. I mean, that, that that begins to hint at the answer. There have been, you know, anti Jewish anti-Zionism is old as Zionism. There's a good way to sum it up. The moment there was a Zionist, Herzl or whoever you want to attribute it to, uh, certainly, in the moment there was a Jewish anti-Zionist. By the way, there were Christian Zionists even before Herzl in the middle of the 19th century. They didn't call themselves Zionists, but they thought some of them anti-Semites, some of them just evangelicals. Thought we got to get all the Jews to Palestine, or else the end of days will never come. Uh, but so, talk about Jewish Zionism now, which begins in the 1890s. Let's say the moment Herzl started uh, talking about this and writing about this, and his, and then he wrote wrote a pamphlet in the late 1890s, there were Jews, Jewish Europeans, people around him in, in Eastern Europe, uh, further Eastern, you know, he was in Vienna, further uh, East than he was, were objecting to this, saying this is counterfeit Judaism. Judaism is not a, not a nation. It's not a one people. It's not a political movement. And it will change the religion to turn it into something that is that and that longs for a state, a, uh, you know, a, a, an actual physical country somewhere. Uh, Herzl was willing to entertain other locations, although he got quickly talked out of that. He was willing to have it in Argentina, Uganda, uh, uh, oh, a few other places, some place off of Africa. What was it, Madagascar? I think. Yeah. And but others said, no, it's got to be. It's got to be in Palestine. It's got to be Palestine because of our uh, biblical roots there. But there were the point is there were there were anti there were Jewish anti Zionists from the, from the moment there were Jewish Zionists, I mean almost simultaneously, uh, because you had the Orthodox who said, you know Herzl's not the Messiah. We can't go back until the, the Messiah. You know God tells us it's time to go back. We they thought their view, it's not factual, but their biblical view was we were expelled. Because uh, that was God's will, because we were sinful. So now we have to wait until God, through the Messiah, tells us to come back. But there are also the Reform, who were further east, uh, were further west, like in Germany and in, in America, who said, that's 2,000 years ago. This is a new world now. And we're not looking to restore, the Reformers saying, we're not looking to restore a nation in Palestine under the sons of Aaron, who were the priests, the high priests. This is a new world now, and, and uh, they saw Judaism as eventually a, a totally universal uh, uh, religion for all, all of mankind. And, uh, and they thought this was a, a backslide to go back to the biblical days where there were isolated tribes in, in Palestine was completely uh, out of sync with what should be going on. They, they saw themselves more in the uh, tradition of the prophets. Mm -hmm. So to, to, for today to say that if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semite— is to be ignorant of history, and chances are they're not ignorant, they're just lying. They want you not to know that, so yeah. people don't know that. Well, but Sheldon, wouldn't they say probably that, yeah, 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 but that was all before the Second World War, and after the Second World War, it was agreed that anybody who cares about Jews supports Zionism, period. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of historical work about what Zionist groups were doing during World War II and right afterwards. And it seems pretty clear from a lot of different sources that the Zionist organizations and individuals like Ben-Gurion and others were much more interested in a state in Palestine than in saving Jews. And I don't want to push that too hard. I don't have a lot of individual knowledge about that, but it's been written about for years. In fact, in the 80s, there was a commission set up in the United States, uh, not a government commission, that was uh, chaired by uh, Arthur Goldberg, former uh, Supreme Court justice and also a cabinet member under Johnson. Uh, he was also he was Johnson's UN uh, uh, ambassador during the, the 67 war. Uh, and um, he chaired this and a draft of their initial report was leaked to the New York Times, which which pointed out 
that the American Zionist organizations were not were for against any plan that would have saved Jews in pla to places that were brought Jewish refugees in Europe to anywhere else but Palestine. They are only interested in Palestine. If and if they weren't going to Palestine, then we don't we're against the plan. And the uh, when, when the when I was leaked to the New York Times, it caused such a fuss that they dis the the uh, the committee disbanded and there was never a final uh, report issued. And there's been lots of work on this. Uh, it's pretty disgraceful what the Zionist organizations would do for them yeah. to invoke now the uh, the Holocaust is really a joke. Norman Fickelstein's been very good on this for them to exploit the Holocaust uh, in you know to the benefit of Israel is really a very cruel, sad, no, I hate to even call it a joke. It's not a joke. Yeah. It's a terrible thing to be done. Uh, you know, Biden said the other day that if it wasn't for Israel, no Jew, no Jewish person in the world would be safe. That's a heck of a thing for the, uh, for the president of the United States to say. Yeah, it's completely terrible. America wouldn't be safe for, for, for Jews if, if there were no Israel, never were in Israel, no Israel now. That's absurd. It's ridiculous. What the hell is he talking about? Well, I'm not sure the exact statistics, Sheldon, but I saw on Twitter someone said, you know, the biggest population of Jews in the world is in the United States of America. This guy is the leader of the national government that's sworn to protect the rights you know, of everyone, <laughs> or at least the states are, and he's, you know, sworn to implement the law under the U.S. Constitution. We all know that thing. But anyway, he's... Yeah. allegedly the head of our security force in this country. And he's going, hey, look, I'm not promising that I can protect you. You might all have to flee. <laughs> I, what? What is he saying? <laughs> That's the craziest thing in the what? world. Imagine him saying that about any other population in the country. And here he's saying it about Jewish people. <laughs> this is the weirdest thing. Although it's just, you know, who knows what Biden's going to ramble at any given time. That's an old cliche from a long time ago that counts as knowledge for a schmuck like him, you know? Uh, well, by the way, I, I, right now, wait a minute, let me, let me hold that thought one sec, Sheldon, because I want to go back to that previous subject real quick, because I had sent you this thing that I had found at some questionable type site, and I had always wondered whether it was true, but then I went and found it at the Torah Jews website, and this is the, again, I believe Hasidic, but certainly Orthodox, right? Hasidic is a subset of Orthodox, but, right? So, anyway... These are the anti-Zionist, but very religious Jews. Let me just say that so I don't miscategorize anyone. They're religious Jews, and they're anti-Zionist. And they had, and you know the names of all these guys, so let me just set you up here. But they had these articles by these rabbis who were making the accusations like you were talking about there. Like, why wouldn't FDR let the Jewish refugees into the country? And it was, one, because the anti-Semites were against it and the Democratic Party in the South and that kind of thing. But it was, two, because the Zionist Jews were against it and lobbied him to prevent Jewish immigration even, you know, like right in the run-up to the war, right at the Evian conference and all of these things. Yeah. So this is just, and, and can you talk about who these guys are? Because these are not like some fringe characters. These are extremely important Jewish leaders from the 20th century that we're talking about well, here, I've right? Read, I've read over the years that Rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Wise, who was the leading uh, Jewish Zionist in the United States, uh, uh, opposed those kinds of programs to get them anywhere. And you could see the point. And also they were afraid that uh, fundraising to, to save, uh, to get refugees to America or Canada or South Africa or, or South America or someplace else or England would run it, would, would conflict with uh, Zionist fundraising. Uh, Stephen Wise was against that. Uh, Tony Greenstein, uh, I think he might have died now. I'm not sure if, if he's still alive. I apologize. He's got a book called uh, uh, oh, Zionism and the Nazis or something like that. They, they were against the Evian. Because, you know, Evian was convened in France with a bunch of countries to uh, see what they could do about taking refugees. Now, not a lot. That was opposed. That conference was opposed. I understand it by Wise and, and, and other big name Zionists. Uh, it didn't really go anywhere. The Dominican Republic apparently was willing to take 100,000 uh, European Jews, and uh, they were lobbied against. You can see the logic, right, of the lobbyists, uh, of the Zionist lobbyists saying, wait a second, if there are other places to go, that's going to put Zionism on the back burner. 
that's going to make it seem not very uh, urgent. And maybe people will forget about it if if Jews can get out, get up to other places. It, you know, at first, uh, the Nazis are trying to uh, get rid of the Jews, n- not to kill them. But Eichmann's hel- is, uh, is uh, you know, uh, getting some of them out. Right. They're, they're, they're leaving the country. And it like, doesn't Eichmann mean that they foresaw the, the Holocaust, right? But it was part of the consequence of their policy. Well, this was before... This was before the, you know, the final solution was formulated. And right. The, and, the, you know, the, the, look, a, a totalitarian government, even when it's under like someone like like Hitler, is not like superbly organized from day one. Right. They don't have a total plan of everything. They're still like feeling around what to do. And and Eichmann, this is in this is in Hannah Arendt's book on Eichmann. He was assigned to read Herzl's The Jewish State, the, the famous thing that kicked everything off the pamphlet, the little book by uh, Eichmann, uh, by uh, Herzl, and he went to Jerusalem. The idea was to, how do we get the Jews out? And and here's something else that uh, doesn't go to the benefit of the of the of Herzl and his people. And this was true for decades until the not before the Nazis even came along. They would they in order to win support among European non-Jews for the Zionist movement, they would say, look, we agree with the anti-Semites. We don't belong here. We are permanently foreigners, uh, uh, aliens, strangers. So help us get to our country. That, that, you know, I think that was really bad. Uh, I'm not saying there wouldn't have been Nazis if they didn't say stuff like that. I can't know that. Mm -hmm. But it didn't help to have the Zionists reinforcing the stupid anti-Semite, you know, uh, view that yeah. the Jews were strangers and had to be strangers. Yeah. There was no, no way to avoid this. They were they were going to always be, you know, interested in money. He was feeding all the stereotypes of the of the anti-Semites. How yeah. could that be good? Yeah. And by the way, when I interjected there, I wasn't able to finish my statement before you kept going. So I I might have made it sound like the the refusal to allow the Jews into the country was what caused the Holocaust. But I just meant what caused those but, Jews to get caught up in it when they could have been safe here was all I was trying to say there. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just, it's unconscionable. And again, they didn't know what was going to happen, but still they knew that something bad was going to happen. They knew that they were, you know, refusing these people entry and knowing that they were turning them back to the tender mercies of the German Nazis in the third Reich under Adolf Hitler, who had anti-Semitism as a policy from day one, you know, um, yeah. is yeah. pretty cynical, bad stuff. And by the way, it's just what a shame that these guys pick right now to redo their website. So true Torah Jews now forwards to TorahJews.org, and it doesn't work anymore. And now they don't have the article anymore. But anyone yeah. can just go to, it's actually easy enough to find, if you just go to the Wayback Machine and put in TrueTorahJews.org slash Lieberman, just like it's always spelled. And you'll see, it's called The Role of Zionism in the Holocaust. It's by Rabbi Gedala, Ged, Gedalia Lieberman. Uh, from Australia. Okay. You know, and on YouTube, if you look to see some of the uh, stuff uh, up there by um, Yaakov Shapiro, who's a rabbi, and he's an Orthodox rabbi. He's not in the Torah Karta, but he's he's a uh, ultra Orthodox. Uh, he he and he's extremely articulate and and culturally uh, relevant. I mean, he has plenty of modern cultural re- references. He's not what you think of as the old Orthodox, which doesn't believe in studying the outside world and stuff like that. He's he's very worldly, but he has the view. Uh, he's got a book also called The Empty Wagon from, as he calls it, he calls it from identity crisis to identity theft. And he accuses Zionism of basically hijacking Judaism and that it's not Judaism and all the reasons why not. And I know reform today, Alan Brownfeld and others, the American Council for Judaism, who say that the, those guys back then were were or real profits, because uh, what matters today, this is changing now, but what has mattered for a very long time now, is that what makes you a person, a good Jew, is to be loyal to Israel. That's like the main thing. You can be an atheist. You can eat pork, you know, three days, for your three days meals, you know, three days, uh, three times a day. And, uh, 
and uh, cheeseburgers all the time. What, but this, if you love Israel, and if Israel's essentially your second country, then uh, you're you're a good Jew. And uh, and they warned about this. It used to be they would say, you know, I'm not I'm not religious. I'm an atheist. I'm, uh, and out of respect for believing Jews, I don't call myself Jewish because I don't. I, I'm an atheist. I, don't, I think that would be disrespectful to the religion for me to call you know use the name. But it, while I don't believe in any of the uh, essentials, but what used to be central to Judaism was obeying God's commandments and uh, and uh, you know obeying the Torah, which was his supposedly his word, the law. Uh, but today, that that's all been displaced, as the Reform warned about, and as the uh, Orthodox warned about. Today, what matters is Israel. It's idol idolatry. And that's and that's often what they say. It's a form of idolatry. They they put. They put the na a nation, a nation state, in where God used to be, according to both the Reform and the Orthodox. And I, it seems to me they're right. Now that doesn't tell you what to do today, what what ought to be done today, because there's a lot of genies out of the bottle that you can't, we can't just put back in now. I mean, there's the violence and blood feuds and and stuff. And I don't have a, I don't have a, any advice to give. I mean, I, I don't know what people should do now. Um, the Palestinians have had a terrible time for many years, uh, and the Israelis are afraid. The Jewish Israelis are, are afraid that they're all, you know, and uh, I'm living safely in the United States, uh, luckily. So I, I'm reluctant to give anybody advice from where I sit. Hey, guys, I've had a lot of great webmasters over the years, but the team at expanddesigns.com have by far been the most competent and reliable. Harley Abbott and his team have made great sites for the show and the Institute, and they keep them running well, suggesting and making improvements all along. Make a deal with expanddesigns.com for your new business or news site. They will take care of you. Use the promo code SCOTT and save $500. That's expanddesigns.com. Man, I wish I was in school so I could drop out and sign up for Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom instead. Tom has done such a great job on putting together a classical curriculum for everyone from junior high schoolers on up through the postgraduate level, and it's all very reasonably priced. Just make sure you click through from the link in the right margin at scotthorton.org. Tom Woods' Liberty Classroom. Real history. Real economics. Real education. Hey, y'all, I got a new coffee sponsor. Mundo's Artisan Coffee at mundosartisancoffee.com. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like my brain is all dried out. I need to pour a hot mug of rich, tasty coffee all over it to get it back working again. Like 10W30 for the noggin. Though not necessary, it helps if the coffee tastes good. Well, Mundo's Artisan Coffee does taste good. They get the best beans from all around the world, and they don't burn them. Support the show and support your brain at MundosArtisanCoffee.com. Just click the link at the right margin at scotthorton.org. Well... You know, here in the United States now, there's such a propaganda campaign about, well, it's just an obvious psyop, bait and switch, distraction tactic. Don't look at the war. Look at the people protesting against the war here. And the tone police are on DEFCON 1 alert status for anyone who uses the J word in the wrong context or, you know, uh, students flying Palestinian flags and you know, even with all of the, the protest chants, I mean, this whole thing, it's amazing that anyone is allowed to get away with this, even the Israel lobby at all, to say, when somebody says this, what they really mean is that. And that's what yeah. we're against is the that, even though we're lying and we just made that up. And this is the dumbest damn thing anybody ever heard of. If anyone ever says Palestinians deserve to be free. Well, what they're really saying is secret code words for kill every Jew in the world and throw them in the ocean. And blah, blah, blah. and then they actually get to implement policies based on that absolute absurdity in broad daylight in front of everyone. And I guess what happened, though, Sheldon, and I don't watch TV, man, so I'm really out of the loop on a lot of this stuff. But what happened was these idiot university deans went up there and... 
when asked about this, instead of saying, look, man, nobody was saying genocide. They were protesting against a genocide or at least this massive ethnic cleansing campaign that's going on in Gaza right now. And none of them were chanting about harming Jews. They were saying, stop the harm that the Israeli government is inflicting on the Palestinians. And that's why I'm not giving in to the fake premise of your stupid question. Instead, these are these complete, ridiculous, mediocre, liberal, you know, academics. So when asked, well, geez, is it against the rules to demand genocide of Jews on your campus? They went, uh, uh and I refuse to say yes, even though, of course, it's against the rules to incite violence like that and always was anyway and whatever. And so they just made total jackasses out of the whole argument and they helped the overall Israel lobby to change the subject from little kids being buried alive right now and and their lives torn to shreds by American bombs dropped by Israeli forces to when college kids said something that I interpret as a secret code word, code whistle, dog whistle for hurting me when and and they did it. In fact, we're even talking about it right now instead of the war. So but go ahead. What, what is really going on with all this crap? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree with what you just said. Uh, they had the three presidents of uh, of three Ivy League uh, uh, universities. They had Harvard, they had MIT, and they had Penn. Uh, all women, by the way. One of them a black woman. I thought that was interesting. Three presidents of, th- of three elite Ivy League schools. Um, so, and then they were grilled. I, I mean, I don't, I agree with you. I, I, I watch on YouTube, so I only saw, uh, one kind of segment, a couple of different lengths of it, but it was this uh, representative uh, Elise uh, uh, Stefanik, uh, who who was also apparently trafficked in the Great Replacement theory. So uh, about how it, so it's kind of odd that she'd be taking this side when she, when she seems to be uh, uh, buying this uh, uh, trope from the crazy right that uh, uh, Jews are bringing trying to bring in immigrants to, in order to water down the uh, mongrelize the white race. Now she's now now she's on this side. Uh, so and I don't want to defend, you know, the, these are these three women. I'm sure I do, uh, don't agree with on anything, any anything else. Uh, but the, the the very nature of the question was designed to put them in a position where what is happening would happen. I think that was probably St- Stefanik's own uh, objective. She asked them is calling for uh, genocide. And uh, either, she asked it two different ways. Does it constitute harassment? And number two, does it violate, uh, you know, your school's code of conduct? And, uh, you know, these three presidents, first of all, as one of the presidents said, I think from Penn said, I, I have no one's calling for genocide. But so she says, the Stefanik then says, his representative Stefanik says, well, wait a second. What about saying from the river to the, the sea or uh, or calling for intifada? So you're right. You you've already identified this, Scott. She's assuming that those phrases mean in this in the mind of the person using the phrases uh, genocide. Now it's funny they don't apply that to Likud, right? The Likud the Likud platform, at least past past platforms, have called for Jewish sovereignty from the river to the sea. And currently, mean, yeah, they've never changed does that. Does that mean the genocide of uh, all Palestinian people? Why not? If, if that's the method, then I can say that they're for genocide. They're endorsed genocide. And they seem to be the ones that. implementing it. So you got an actual argument there. Now, you know, who else says that? Gideon Levy says it, who's a Jewish columnist for Raharetz. He doesn't mean uh, any kind of genocide when he says uh, fr- uh, freedom from the uh, from the river to the sea. So and the same with intifada. Intifada, that word, we know we have come to know that word. Uh, because it, it's an Arabic word for uprising, it was used against occupation in the West Bank. Uh, some of the, some of the people, especially in the Second uh, Intifada, uh, aimed aimed at uh, innocent people, at civilians. I mean, if you a bomb a civilian bus or a cafe, that's horrible. And but but initially, it starts off as going after you know kids like throwing stones at at soldiers. I mean, hardly like uh, existential threat or anything like that. Uh, It was an uprising against an attempted uprising, at least against an occupation. So if you use that as a phrase, uh, you know, uh, Stefanik is yanking it out of context to say that means genocide. No one was using that term to mean genocide. 
Uh, you can condemn Hamas. You can condemn its horrible charter, uh, which it's you know never formally taken back, even though in later years it said, "Okay, we'll take a we'll take a uh, separate state on the 67 borders." But it was very grudging. They said, "We're not that we're going to recognize Israel." Uh, and you know, in, the, in their initial charter, they called for death of Jews. But that's the thing is, if you treat people, here's what I like to say: hardliners on one side encourage the hardliners on the other side. That always happens in any dispute, not just the uh, Palestinian-Israeli dispute. The, they're, they're almost tacit allies. It's as if they get together in a room saying, look, you take the hardest line possible, and then we can take the hardest line possible in response to you, and then you can take it in response to us, and so on. You know, it's, uh, I think that's a very old story. I'm not saying they sit in a room, but it's as if. It's as if they do that. The other thing is if you treat people like animals, and as my son reminded me, we treat animals better than this, but just to go with the cliche here, some, some people are going to act like animals. So what, what Hamas did, and I know they're still counting, the cat people are still counting the casualties, I don't want to get into that, but certainly Hamas did horrible things on the 7th of October. But as we all know, history did not begin on the 7th of October. Now, I told this to someone who I've known literally all my life who told me that makes me an apologist for terrorism. The fact that I say it didn't, history didn't begin on the 7th makes me an apologist for terrorism. Uh, I don't know what to say in response to that. The fun, funny thing is th that's, a that's a double standard because if, if I were to say to Israel, you know, I think history began on October 8th, what would an Isra pro-Israeli person say to me? No, it didn't. Well, why can't we say that about what Palestinians do, even if they're terrible things that they've done to be condemned? We can still say, as the UN Secretary General said, and I, it, I don't agree with him on much, but I agreed with him on this, it didn't happen in a vacuum. That wasn't to forgive what happened, because initially he said there's no justification for the civilian deaths and kidnap take, kidnapping on the 7th by Hamas. But it didn't happen in a vacuum. Both those statements can be true. There are some people committed to the view that those two statements can't be true. And if you say the second one, you are effectively wiping out the first one. And I disagree with that. But like I said, I've been called by a, a loved one, an apologist for terrorism for saying it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the fact of the matter is, just because you are Sheldon Freegan Richmond. And you are special and know so much and care so much about this. Doesn't mean that regular people are, you know, run of the mill, um, you know, less interested folk know enough to be in a real argument with you about it. Like, that's all they're going to have is a cliche about, well, if you're not on this side, then you're on the other side because isn't that how it always works? And you can't really blame somebody for that if they're just a normal. You know what I mean? Like, if this person is some yeah. kind of Democrat, then by all means, fight them. But, you know, I think what we need, and I was hearing an interview with the head of uh, FIRE, which is a very good organization, right? The, the Foundation for Indiv Individual Rights and Expression, yeah. which has consistently stood for free speech on campuses and beyond. That's why the, the E is now for expression, not, not in education. Right. Uh, and that they, goes they for sticking up for right wing kids that are being oppressed and silenced and also sticking right. up for left wing kids being oppressed and silenced too. that same organization is good on both and, and what, has and been what, consistent. What, and what Greg Lugiano, who's the head of it, the fire said is if, if, the, if the, the key to respecting free speech on campuses, and I know this now gets away from the actual conflict, we're now back talking about this, what seems like a distraction talking about free speech on campuses is at least have the ability to put yourself in the other person's position. And I don't think the defenders of Israel, you know, just the knee-jerk defenders, ever do that. Uh, you know, I, look, I was brought up with a standard American conservative Jewish education about Israel. I went to Hebrew school, and that was little more than inculcating a love of Israel. I think Israeli flag was in the, uh, in the classroom along with the American flag. There wasn't any, any other nation's flag there. Uh, just Israel and, uh, and the United States. So I, at some point, decided to take another look at it. A lot of people never do that. I'm, and I'm not giving myself some great credit here. It's something that is perfectly within the capabilities of everybody. 
but you need to try to put yourself in the other person's uh, position. Now, I do this regarding the Zionists. I I totally understand that if you're uh, if you're Jewish and living in Europe, especially in the, toward the East. But you know, not everything's great in the West. But Europe was very lumpy, and even in the 19th century and earlier. Some places were very bad. Some places were not as bad. Some places were good for a while. I mean, it's a very granular thing. You can't just say, oh, it's only anti-Semitic as if it's a, you know, like a bowl of gruel in front of you. That's just a single consistency and single quality. It differs from place to place. But there's there's obviously issues we're talking about before the Nazis. So we don't even have the Nazis to point to. Terrible things, the pogroms in the late 19th century in uh, Ukraine and, you know, things part of the Russian Empire and Poland. There's a problem because you might want to say, you know, we need to do something. This is terrible. Is it going to change or not? So Zionism, to gi- to give you know the the best of the people the benefit of the doubt, was an attempt at an answer. Okay, we need to do something. So you know, I think we can put ourselves in, in that position and say, yeah, what would you do? What would you think? It was a hor- it was a horrible situation. Uh, and I don't know what the answer. If I lived back then, I don't know what the answer. What I would have said, what I thought was the right answer, uh, you know, it's easy to say, well, come to the United States today. But of course, in 1924, Calvin Coolidge signed a, a, an Immigration Restriction Act, which really cut back and make, created very low quotas on immigration from not only Eastern Europe, but also Southern Europe. So it was aimed more uh, also at Italians and Greeks. It wasn't just anti-Jewish, uh, but one of the effects was to really uh, have very low quotas. Uh, on Eastern Europeans. And those were the quotas that Roosevelt appealed to in the 30s when he said, we got quotas. I can't, what can I do about it? We got quotas. And they turned that ship away and all that stuff in St. Louis. Uh, so I think it's very important if we if we care about speech, to, we can be civil by at least, in, in you know, at a quiet moment, put yourself in the other person's point of, you know, shoes and uh, at least try to see it as he sees it. It doesn't mean then surrender your view and take that view up, but at least think about it that way. And I think people need to do that. Uh, I thought that that hearing in Congress was was totally ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, look, you, you need to give a nuanced answer when you, when the question is about speech, because we have a First Amendment, and just saying something uh, is not regarded as uh, even you know in the Supreme Court uh, 1969 Brandenburg case, you, that was a KKK leader who advocated violence against politicians uh, if, if they uh, continue to, you know, downgrade the white race in that guy's view. The Supreme Court said that doesn't constitute incitement, so it's protected speech. So even if we're only going to rely on Supreme Court uh, jurisprudence, it's not enough to say, even if you said, had uh, put out a pamphlet saying, I think all the Jews should be killed, and nobody's done that. Uh, and it would be horrible, of course, but it doesn't mean you should go to prison for that. Now, if you're pointing at someone to, and then say to a mob, let's go kill that guy for whatever reason, whatever he's a member of some group you don't like. Yeah, that's, you know, that's uh, that sounds actionable. It's not just speech. Well, it's not a on a university campus, Sheldon, I'm pretty sure if you just put out flyers saying Jews should be killed, that you get kicked out of school for that. But again, that's not an issue here. And I don't that's know what the rules done. are on the different campuses. And I don't know. But not nobody done. did anything like that here is with such a red herring. But that's right. That's right. Uh, the the biggest thing is seems to be from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And uh, you can disagree with that. You could think, well, that's not how it would come out. The uh, you know the Palestinians would would kill the Isra- the Jewish Israelis. You may you may predict that and say that can't be the solution. Okay, argue that point. But it's not a call for genocide to say there ought to be one free. They say democratic. You and I are not crazy about democracy because we're for individual rights. Uh, but one free democratic. Uh, a uh, country where every every adult can vote uh, in that that region from the the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, there are plenty of Jewish people that <laughs> take that position. So it can't be a call for genocide. Well, and that's um, what that Stefanik tried to uh, claim, and she should have been laughed. She should be a laughing stock, but she's not. Well, what about the turn of the right into 
ridiculous quivering little genderless snowflakes at the at the mention of Israel. Right. All of the free speech, not all, many of the free speech yeah. crusaders of the past, you know, PC times here with all the woke stuff. Now couldn't be more woke. Yeah, you're right. It's the mirror image of the, uh, you know, those those uh, presidents, those uh, university presidents, because in the university presidents and and others, many others like them, other other college administrators. We've seen this time after time, just like you're talking about when it comes to speeches on, uh, you know, regarding racism, affirmative action. Uh, yeah. This, uh, so uh, the, the gender nonsense uh, They're 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 against free speech when. The people they would like, the woke side, gets their feelings hurt. Therefore, they can claim they're endangered. And this other side now that you're talking about, the so-called right, which is kind of an empty word, but the, well, let's call you know, for the sake of uh, conversation, the right is against free speech when anti-woke people, the anti-woke side in their eyes, uh, doesn't like the speech and gets their feelings hurt, and then claims they're endangered. It's just the mirror image. So both sides are hypocrites, but it's, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're reversed in their, in their hypocrisy. So there are very few people that are being completely consistent about this. Um, and that's a shame because it's you feel kind of lonely if you really try to be nuanced and consistent. You find yourself, uh, you know, there aren't many taking that position. Most people have, uh, you know, they know what their tribe is. They put on the right T-shirt. They put on the right ball cap. And they know they have the talking points and that's all they that's all they need now. I know who, what's my team doing. OK. And now I know what to do. And then the other side does the same thing. It's, just, it's you know, it's not as horrible as what's going on in the in the in, the, in Palestine and Israel. So I'll give it that. But it's pretty it's pretty horrible because look at the rancor. I mean, there's people screaming at each other. It's just it's very depressing. That's not the way you get a prosperous society. Yeah. And look, as far as all the woke stuff goes, as despicable as all kind of censorship and intimidation of people from being able to just say what they want is. This is all on behalf of a foreign nation in the middle of a massive war crime ethnic cleansing campaign. They've slaughtered at an extremely conservative estimate at this point would be 15,000 civilians plus maybe a few thousand Hamas fighters, but no leaders over two months here. And yeah. that's the context of what's really happening. Right. The numbers are growing to like unbelievable proportions. I think we're nearing 20. So, but now total. you're supposed to have to sacrifice your freedom of speech as an American citizen so that Agents of a foreign power can have their public relations dominance over yeah. our country so that we can continue to be forced by our government to pay for this. And, of course, not just in dollars, but in the, you know, unavoidable terrorist blowback that we're absolutely certain to suffer from this. Well, in the words of Biden, until the White House walked it back, uh, Israel's involved in indiscriminate bombing of uh, Gaza. Biden said that yesterday. Yeah, and in the uh, same statement, he said, "And we're still sending them bombs, and we're we're protecting them. We're we're helping them protect themselves." What you just said? They're indiscriminately bombing people. How is that protecting condemned, themselves? He also condemned the. People it's like who W. Bush, this. right? You're supposed to just say, "Yeah," but the guy's an idiot. Nothing he says makes sense, so you're not supposed to try to make sense out of it. But I think you should try to make sense out of it and notice how it does not make sense. And these okay. two positions are extremely incongruent. What the hell? And there you can attribute it to age. I'm not sure that's the reason, but how do you do? You can't do that with Blinken. Blinken talks out of both sides of his mouth. Israel has to uh, be more careful about civilians, but. You know, does that show up in any other way? No, he's totally with uh, uh, Netanyahu. So uh, you're right. It's just uh, it's a joke. The funny thing is they may think they're trying to please everybody for political reasons, but they're not pleasing anybody. I can't believe they're pleasing any side. So uh, even politi by political calculation, I don't see how that's supposed to work. But that's a secondary question. Who cares about, you know, American politics? What, what's happening is terrible over there. Yeah, uh, all the, the devastation, the hospitals being destroyed, the 
you know, it's heartbreaking if you think, and I try not to think about it. I don't, I know you guys have to do it. You keep up with the numbers and you, you talk to, uh, um, you know, the, the fellow over at NAWAR.com uh, every few days to talk about the latest numbers. I can't focus on that. It's just too depressing. I can't do anything about it. The numbers are growing. It's going to be 20,000 soon and 10,000 kids. It's heading that direction. It's not anywhere near over. They told them to go south and then they bomb in the south. Uh, what are you supposed to do? So it's just to completely heartbreaking. And, no, you know, one state, two states, I can't see the Israelis going for either one of those. Red state, blue state. Sounds yeah. like a Dr. Sue. Listen, man, that's as good a place to end it as any. <laughs> okay. It's just total dejected frustration. I feel it too, man. I mean, the headline I'm reading right now as you say that, the picture story on antiwar.com today is this massive explosion or two at the time, maybe here, surely dozens of people being killed at once or more. And it says, Israel says Gaza onslaught will continue, quote, with or without world support. So... Yeah. Um, now, that's not really true. The president of the United States could pick up the phone and end this war right now, but he's the only one who could, probably, other than the prime minister over there. And he's not calling that shot. So here we are. I don't know what to say. Well, to bring this back to the very beginning, I'll be real quick. My article tomorrow on uh, uh, libertarianinstitute.com is, a, is an Dot excerpt org. from the 1958 uh, a journal article which has a lot of quotations from Ahad Ha'am, whose uh, name was Asher Ginsburg. He was a contemporary of Herzl's. He was a, what they call a cultural Zionist. He was not for a state. He was for a cultural revival and, uh, you know, maybe some presence in Palestine. But he, right from the start, condemned the, Zion, the political Zionist treatment of the Arabs in Palestine. So... Look at that article tomorrow. You'll find lots of quotations from this guy, Ahad Ha'am, that was his pen name. Asher Ginsburg was his real name, about how badly the Zionists were treating and talking about the uh, the Palestinians. The, he was using the word Arabs in Palestine. So this is not a new thing, Jewish criticism. This goes back, as I said, to the very beginning. And, I, and there you'll see. You'll see it in that article. Aren't you guys? That's the great Sheldon Richmond. The book is coming to Palestine. And check out his great article every Friday. The goal is freedom at libertarianinstitute.org. Thanks, sir. Thank you. The Scott Horton Show and Anti War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.